is Michelle Brazos. Um, I work here at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Okay, we're going to do, uh, in this module, we're going to do databases and visualization tools, and then we're going to conclude by getting you up on the Amazon cloud so you can spend the rest of the week actually doing uh, the cancer genomics uh, workshop. Okay, uh, this is what Francis would like to dis disclaim here. Um, he doesn't profit from any of this information. However, he was a former employee of NCBI. I think he was there for six years. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of NCBI content down here. He is a current employee of OICR, and he makes no apologies for that because he's going to put that content in here too. These are his uh, communication mechanisms. Uh, they're not mine. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask him <laughs> about, about his content. Um, he's quite active uh, and we'll get back to you uh, quite quickly. So what are we going to cover? We're going to talk about uh, databases. Databases in general in bioinformatics um, It's more of a refresher of how databases are organized and structured. And then specifically give a, a chat about um, cancer databases. Uh, we're going to switch to um, someone who knows IGV better than myself, so that you'll, we'll talk about visualization. We'll also talk a little bit about visualization within ICGC, the International Cancer Genomics Consortium. Um, and then we're going to conclude with logging into uh, AWS and getting you set up for the workshop. So why do we have bioinformatics? Um, Anybody want to wager again? I mean, it's not a it's not a, a, a old field per se. It's definitely a new field. Um, you know, certainly when I was studying in undergraduate uh, courses, bioinformatics wasn't even a course. It wasn't even a topic in a course. Uh, it was pretty much nothing. Uh, and now here I am working in uh, an informatics department which is 130 people big, and the lab group is only 30 people big. So it's, there's been a complete reversal. Uh, and that's probably because of all the genomics and proteomics technologies out there just pumping data into the, um, into the internet. And all that data we have access to. So uh, it, you know, it, it is, uh, a young field, but it did start uh, in the in the late 60s or uh, early 70s with the publication of the Atlas of Protein Sequence and Structure, Margaret Dayhoff, um, and she just wanted to put protein um, sequence together, uh, and she published it in a paper book. Uh, certainly, that doesn't seem feasible when you talk about genomes, but um, very quickly it became evident that being able to search across those sequences, protein or genomic sequences as the case is now, uh, and do comparisons and ask questions of that sequence would be of, of very significant value. And BLAST came about because of that need to ask questions on that, on that sequence. Um, and GenBank obviously came about as a place to store that sequence, not in paper uh, formats. Um, Francis thinks uh, of bioinformatics the same way that wet lab people think about their wet lab experiments. And you can do experiments in bioinformatics. I mean, that's the, that's the point of having all this data. Um, and, it, and it's the same way. You, you, you have reagents, so he calls his the sequence uh, information, the databases where you're getting this information as your reagents. Um, you are going to do some experiment, you're going to do some protocol, you're going to uh, uh, align your protein, align your nucleotide to protein, etc. So you're doing some search against that sequence, that's your protocol, and you get some alignment on which you need to make an interpretation. So in Francis's uh, sphere. This is this is a bioinformatics experiment, uh, and it, I mean it's the same. You still have to do all the same things. You're going to have your 
uh, reagents, you're going to have your methods, and you're going to have your controls, and you need to ask the appropriate questions and design your experiment in an appropriate manner. Uh, certainly this is really relevant in cancer space. Uh, you find a variant. Is your variant uh, normal? Is your variant a real variant? Is your variant contributing to the, um, uh, the cancer progression and development? Uh, so so you can't, we should be doing experiments with uh, bioinformatics. Okay, uh, Francis is a great um, proponent of uh, think pair share. So we're going to take a moment to do think pair share. Uh, and his uh, request is how do you define bioinformatics computational biology? So look to your neighbor, look to your person behind you, and we'll take one minute and think pair share what your definition of bioinformatics computational biology might be. Please. Okay, folks. Anybody want to uh, shout out their definition of bioinformatics computational biology? Anybody? Anybody? Yes. Um, so we were saying how uh, bioinformatics is, is, is basically anything where you're just looking at data, lots of data that's biologically relevant. And we thought computational, well, at least especially I thought computational biology is more when you're applying algorithms and trying to like sort that data. Sure. I, I think there's no one definition of, of bioinformatics. Anybody else? Me, when I'm teaching in the high school classes, I'm breaking down the word bio. It's got to do with biology, information, lots of information, and Maddox is like the automation of something. The, like, you know, the, uh, uh, there's no one definition. Uh, f the uh, uh, one offered by Francis is bioinformatics be is about integrating biological themes together with the help of computer tools, biological databases, and gaining new knowledge about the system in study. Um, I think, yes, I think it's the last part here is that the, uh, the objective is ob obtaining new knowledge. There is a reason we're doing bioinformatics, uh, and particularly in cancer research, and that is to gain new knowledge about uh, the tumor under investigation. Um, you're going to see these symbols a whole bunch uh, um, in bioinformatics space. Bioinformatics is, is hugely... Uh, based upon openness, open access, open source, open data, open training materials. You can't do bio. You can It's ridiculous if you develop an algorithm such as Blast and there was no data to blast upon. Uh, so the the whole crux of bioinformatics is really dependent upon everything being open. Uh, and so I would encourage you, if your labs are already not doing it, is to, to partake in that openness. Um, a new, the newest thing has the, coming up is the, the open publications. Bio, who, who's published in bioarchives uh, or in, an, in other open access fashion? Yeah, yeah, a few hands. So this is coming, this, this sort of like open publication. Uh, such that you don't have to log in and into and wait for for a publication to become available, uh, etc. It's frustrating when you're in PubMed and you hit that journal that doesn't have that, right? Anyways, um, that's a, a little bit of a tangent. Okay, so uh, going back to our bioinformatics uh, experiment, the reagent being um, the place where all of that sequence information is located. Databases. Uh, databases are an organized array of information. It's where we're putting all of that sequence data. Uh, and if it's placed in there well, you should be able to get it back out. Um, there are instances where you can't get it back out, but then most people won't be using those databases. Um, the the bonus of a database is the um, overarching layer of being able to query that database uh, and view that data. So uh, if we have the structure of a database, um, I'm just trying to, can you see my mouse? I've lost my mouse. 
here. Oh, here it is. Okay, sorry. It's, I'm, I'm not visually seeing it here. Um, so you have your um, data. You have data and its inherent metadata. Anybody want to wager a guess what the, without looking at your notes, but that metadata might be? What might metadata refer to? Structure and framework in which data is represented. Uh, yeah, and the and the tags of uh, on those various kinds of data, right? So so date stamps, um, ver ex uh, little the little details um, around a particular bit of of data. Like this variant was first identified on such and such a date. Like sometimes that that this metadata is actually quite useful, and it needs to to be cross matched against other databases. So that's the, the metadata is used to, to link those things together, right? Um, then you have your data, uh, and this is probably what we're most familiar with, um, uh, particularly uh, if, you're, if you've gone to NCBI and GenBank, you, you know the file, or if you've gone to Cosmic, you know the, the, the Cosmic record. Um, these are some other examples that are synonyms that you um, you know, it, it would be the title of a book in a, in, um, in a book. All this data and its inherent metadata is stored within a system. Um, and we're not, vi the system is not visible to us, but it is, it's the back end of the database. It is the MySQL, it is the Oracle, it is um, the analogy being the bookshelf. It is, it is the thing that is housing all of this data and, and allowing the next level to make it queryable so uh, that you can ask questions on this data. Um, uh, you're going to be doing a lot in this workshop. We're going to be doing grepping and, and searches from the command line, things that you, you can interact with this uh, database and this query, queryability of the database. Um, for non-command line people, the next bit is actually probably the most important: is the the presentation of this system, the the interface between you and the database, uh, into which you can ask your question if you're not asking it from a command line point of view. Uh, and so this this is probably what most of us are familiar with. Any questions about that in na database nature? Okay. So um, what does NCBI have to offer? Um, it's a way to uh, submit that data, learn about that data, analyze that data, download, develop, do research, etc. with that data. It's a sort of a one-stop shop. Uh, with your with all of the available data internationally, I'm talking about NCBI, but that doesn't mean if you're coming from Europe or you're coming from Asia, uh, and you're more familiar with uh, EBI or DDBJ, that those are the similar spaces to NCBI in North America, and uh, this representation here is that. All three of those database, all three of those databases um, share their information every 24 hours. So, so whether you're looking through EBI or whether you're looking through DDBJ, all of that information is being shared um, in the open fashion that bioinformatics encourages. Uh, such that everybody is talking about the same thing. We need to be talking about the same thing. We, you can't do research if you're not talking about the same thing. Um, there's now going to be a chunk of slides uh, related to NCBI and related to how NCBI is structured and its files, etc. This is because Francis worked at NCBI and he worked in GenBank and this is, this is where uh, his his specialty is from. So I'm going to do my best to give that justice. NCBI can do, is so much more than just GenBank. It is, um, if I had kids doing science fair projects, I'd be sending them here because you can do books and 
chemical mul you can do everything it's a it's a great source of, of lots of information uh, literature health genomics proteins chemicals uh, and for any of those things there's the associated database uh, with that housed within NCBI but they're equivalent databases in EBI and DDBJ so uh, it is not specific to NCBI all the information is shared out some some places are you know EBI maybe has um, has a bit more strength in the chemical space than NCBI but uh, they're, they're still all sharing their information landing page for NCBI if you haven't been there recently um, and the formats used by NCBI. Um, actually, if I'm going to stress anything that you're going to learn from the Cancer Genomics Workshop, is you're going to learn a lot of file format conversion. Getting from one file format to the next file format to the next file format, and finally ending up in the file format that makes sense to you, uh, such that you can carry forward on your research. Um, Certainly in the uh, sequence space, we're starting with uh, FASTA files. Everybody is familiar with a FASTA file, I'm quite sure. Um, we're, we're, from a sequencing point of view, there is the FASTQ file, um, or the BAM-SAM file, which is the, the pre-aligned file. So we're actually going to work through the FASTQ SAM BAM file over the next couple of days, getting to your VCF files, uh, and then looking at functional annotation uh, on that file. So there's, you know, there's a hierarchy of file formats, and um, I might alter my bioinformatics definition and say that it is a lot of file format conversion, is <laughs> what, uh, but what I sometimes think bioinformatics is all about. Um, Certainly there is uh, layers of, of databases, um, you know, from, from a primary research perspective, you may only be working in the archival databases, the databases that just pretty much just store all the data um, and with the associated metadata, their annotations. Uh, I think that a more valuable space, certainly a space when you're, when you're trying to make biological in, uh, interpretations from your data, is the secondary data, the highly curated data, um, which has a human oversight on it. That is, somebody has gone in and said that these are all the, the reference sequences and this is the correct annotation for this particular gene, and this is this is certainly um, the the secondary databases um, are are really 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 valuable. Uh, every year, I don't know if you're aware, but there's two there's actually two publications that come out in nucleic acid research that are maybe worth at least browsing the titles. Um, one is the database issue, which comes out in January, and, and in July, so shortly, is the web, uh, the web tools issue. Um, and it's just a, a really neat way to pay attention to what new data has come out and what new tools to compute on that data are coming out within a, within a year. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting um, I, I used to manage the, the, up, the um, integration of these tools into the links directory and it's just really interesting from looking at a title in an abstract perspective what uh, new tools are, are needed or, or necessary, what new databases are coming out. Anyways, uh, so January 2016 obviously is already out. Uh, for database issue and upcoming we have July 2016 will be the web tools. Okay, that was a tangent. The tangent was probably there because Francis is editor of the database, so I, I didn't make these slides or order them, so I'm just, I have to go with, with what is the next slide coming up here, so bear with me. So we're going back now to GenBank. And we're talking about uh, the file formats and we, we, we were saying that one of the biggest things that you're going to do in bioinformatics is converting file formats. The flat file, the initial file created within GenBank. Um, I don't know if you've spent any time looking through this file. You probably scroll down right to the end. 
uh, or you just say show me output the file in in FASTA. But the, there's a lot of information. So the, there's it's divided in three: the header, the features, and the sequence. Um, mostly, you're either scrolling down to the sequence, uh, but there's a lot of information within this file. Um, the it's the human readable version of of submitted data. Um, it, yeah, I'm just gonna. I'm not sure what was meant to be said there. Accession numbers. So each file, though, within GenBank has an associated accession number. Uh, and it's actually quite useful to know what the accession number is because you can gain a lot of information from, from the number itself. Um, so the format within GenBank differs depending on the sequence input. Uh, you could have a 1 plus 5 model, meaning one letter, five numbers, 2 plus 5. In the case of whole genome sequence, you would have 4 plus 2 plus 6. Um, Proteins and, ref and RefSeq uh, files have similar but different uh, formats. And everything is versioned. So if a single nucleotide changes in the from the original file, you'll get the same accession number, but you'll get a different version. So you all when you do a, a, a BLAST search and it pulls up all of these uh, particular uh, hits, you want to make sure that you're actually on the most current version. So you want to, you know, if there's more than one version, you're going to choose version 3 instead of version 1. Unless that you were pre-computing on version 1. What it, just pay attention to the, to the versions. The other useful bit of information about um, accession numbers um, is, the, is the coding up front. NC underscore NG underscore NM and R. It'll tell you what the sequence is, uh, corresponding sequences. So NM is messenger RNA sequence file. Uh, NR is going to be an RNA file, and this differs. So you can very quickly see what, you know, if you have a, a whole list of a, a whole bunch of hits and you're only looking for RNA, well, you're going to click on the NR underscore file as opposed to the NC underscore file. Um, NCBI is running out of numbers, so they're actually going uh, and expanding their <laughs> accession numbers. Uh, because I don't know what they're going to do when they run out of digits, numerical digits. They might, may, may, maybe they'll increase the uh, the letter digits as well. I have no idea, but interesting. We're running out of we're running out of unique numbers. Um, assemblies within uh, NCBI also have um, interesting annotation models. Everything is. You can read a lot from these accession numbers, as I was saying. The model, the model organism uh, files also have the X in front of them, so it's a good indication that that's uh, a model file. Uh, whole genome sequence, the special cases. I don't know what he meant to say in this, other than pay attention if it's an NZZP. Uh, not sure. Okay, this is a, a FASTA, uh, FASTA um, format, which you should all be familiar with. You've probably seen this uh, quite a few times. This one is quite a good FASTA, form, a FASTA file because it actually has the information up here about uh, the accession number, the reference. So, so we know that this is a NP, so it was in the protein space. Um, and uh, th with the accession number and the version number, uh, and then some descriptor of the of the sequence. So it's the p53 isoform nine, and the and the organism that it's from. Um, if that is missing, and it's just an arrow, it's kind of it's really hard to to tell. But and sometimes that is missing. It's just empty, and you don't know what that that information is. Uh, NCBI publishes regularly on the, the updates and the resources, as does EBI. And D, uh, I haven't actually seen DDBJ re, uh, publication recently on, 
on an update from from there but they they must similarly provide updates on all of their things um, from a biological perspective I think as uh, Trevor was um, impl it had also discussed having a presentation of that data visual presentation of that data and overlapping that data with other data in the same space is actually really valuable so um, most of you probably spend your time in UCSC genome browser. Yes, no. What, what, what is your favorite genome browser? You, I don't know. Anybody? Anybody other than UCSC? Sorry? IGV. IGV. Oh, great. Look, when we get to IGV, you can come on up front. Um, yeah, so we're going to spend the rest of the week actually using IGV, but at some point you cross back to... Uh, uh, the, the database browser, the UCSC Ensemble and CBI Map Viewer. I'm not a big fan of the Map and CBI Map Viewer. Uh, I understand the UCSC a little bit better. Uh, a new browser coming out uh, or is out um, in the uh, cancer space is the ICGC browser. So um, the International Cancer Genome Consortium database which houses all the tumor data for the ICGC project has a browser uh, and it's modeled after the UCSC genome browser so it has those layers and those tracks um, and that's really a useful space to see where your variants are and, and what your variants are doing. Um, this is an example of TP53 and all the various uh, tracks for, for TP53 um, mutation within uh, NCBI. Okay, um, the Genome Reference Consortium, we said, uh, as you recall, it's the highly curated, oh no, G GRC, this is the uh, Human Reference, Genome Reference Consortium. The These guys are um, constantly uh, updating the annotation of the human reference genome. So we're on version GRCH38, but 39 is already available, and at some point we'll switch over. Uh, or maybe you have already... Are anybody computing on 39 already? Yes, no. Possibly. It's G38. Yeah, most are most are still computing on HG uh, GRC H thirty eight, uh, but then then the next version is is available. Um, so uh, yeah, so it the the release of the human genome happens, and then all the tools and browsers etc spend some time catching up and doing uh, recomputing before everybody moves over to the next annotation uh, and it's it's iterative uh, and there's it's well documented what changes in each of the uh, in each of the human versions um, oops sorry going the wrong way uh, Historically, the, the human genome data, uh, we didn't start with the whole genome. But obviously, we started with this expression sequence tag sequences. Uh, we moved to mapping uh, and GWAS studies, etc. Then we, you know, uh, did, event, did eventually come up with the human, uh, the full human genome. Same time in parallel all, with all this sequence technology. Um, high throughput sequence technology coming out. You could start to think about doing tumor projects. So the TCGA had a pilot project. Uh, a thousand genomes project is happening. Uh, the pilot project for TCGA is successful and they expand it out. Uh, and then the ICGC project uh, comes on board. The ICGC project was October 2, 2007. That was my first day at work, <laughs> so it was it was a really interesting day because uh, ICGC was just getting announced. Um, 
we're, we're going to, in a moment, we'll talk about the differences between TCGA and ICGC. There's similarities and differences. Um, but the, the cancer space started, didn't start with these, these big international projects. They obviously started with, with much small, smaller scale projects, uh, looking at 18,000 genes, looking at uh, 518 genes, but across more tumors, uh, and, then, and then moving into um, use, uh, sequencing data and doing uh, full-scale tumor sequencing. But from these smaller projects, there were a couple of things that were critical to the current international projects. And from those smaller scale projects, you, we, we learned that hetero, there is a lot of heterogeneity within a tumor and cross tumors, uh, that there's a high rate of abnorm abnormalities, and, and that there there needs to be some standard approaches to laboratory protocols if you're going to start to combine all of this data. So these were sort of, from those earlier projects, those were some of the lessons that were learned that fed into the bigger international projects such that they got off, I think, on a much better uh, footing than, um, than would otherwise have been possible. So the International Cancer Genome uh, Consortium, uh, as I said, started my first day of work. Uh, its goal was to collect 500 tumor normal pairs from each of 50 different uh, tumor types. So it works out to 25,000 sequence sequences. That's quite. It's huge. It was a. It's an enormous undertaking, um, and the intent was to be comprehensive on that sequence, to look at the genome, the transcriptome, the methylome, and incorporate the clinical data. Uh, and underscoring all of that was to make it available internationally. If it was an international project and Japan is contributing and Spain is contributing, then you know they're contributing their part, but they want to compute across everything. Um, so it set up the, the, this rationale. Um, pool our resources, really, and, and do it all together as, as opposed to doing it individually. Um, it makes for your, a better uh, N value. You don't, you're not just doing 10 pancreatic. You might have 500 pancreatic. Uh, and uh, if everything is done in a standard uniform format, then you can... Um, be more confident that the the sequence that was done in uh, Spain is the sequence that was done in Vancouver, etc. Um, the so this this is the rationale for the ICGC, and these are the kinds of things that were put into the ICGC project. Uh, you know, the pro tumor, what tumor are you looking at? What patient? Uh, what, information about the sample collection, information about how the sample is extracted, information about the sequence, about the analysis on that sequence, and then information about the interpretation. We'll go through some of those. Uh, in its current point of, um, in December 2015, there are 85 projects uh, across 18 uh, countries, jurisdictions, actually, I'm going to say jurisdictions because some countries have two locations. Uh, and we're covering 42 of the 50 cancer types that were set out. Currently, there are 15,000 donors. Um, and uh, at this point, I think it's probably uh, uh, much of our research couldn't be done without those donors. So those donors are, are to be applauded uh, for their participation in, in the study. Um, ICGC undergoes data releases twice a year. And uh, we just had a, a, a release, and another release is coming up. Uh, but this is the growth of the data within the ICGC uh, data, data space. The URL for ICGC uh, and highlighting all of its current 42 projects. Uh, Canada participates in um, at least two. Heather, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I know we do pancreatic and we do breast. I don't, I'm not sure if we do any other projects from Canada space, but you can look that up. 
prostate as well? Okay. Um, so and uh, there's that. Within the ICGC um, uh, website, there is uh, it can you can navigate towards any of the parts of the ICGC. You can you can uh, navigate towards the data portal, DACO, which is the uh, data access coordination center. You can get information. You can log in. Um, the DCC. So this is the data coordination center. That DCC is actually situated here in this building. OICR is the host for the uh, Data Coordination Center. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and the teams upstairs have put a lot of work into development of the portal. And this is their, their portal. Um, yes, so we, we just had a release on May 16. That's how recently there was a release. Um, release 21. So the data portal, uh, we're, there is a, a lab exercise, so we'll, we'll move into that in this afternoon. But um, it's really, really uh, instructional uh, data portal. You can keyword search. Uh, you can also do faceted searching. So uh, you can select what tumor type you're interested in. You could select the project by the country. Uh, you can select the particular variants that you might be interested in uh, or, or the uh, uh, tumor type. Sorry, this would be uh, organ type, I guess. Uh, this is a display of the somatic mutation rate across selected projects. So uh, projects over on the left-hand side have less uh, frequency of mutations and projects on the right hand side have a higher frequency of mutation. It's just a really interesting way to see how different tumors have different uh, uh, mutation rates. Um, they display always on the first page the top 20 most mutated genes. Of course, TP53 is the first one there. Uh, but it's sometimes interesting to, to look um, at some of the, uh, the other um, mutations. And, and you can identify whether that mutation is highly mutated in the tumor of interest to you. Uh, the way ICGC, the way the DC, I'm just going to omit the word ICGC uh, and just go to DCC. The way the, the DCC is organized is by uh, entities. So you can look at projects, which is like, what, what is Spain doing or what is Canada doing? Uh, so you can look at, at, at projects. In this case, we're looking at breast cancer, TCGA. Um, it also has gene entity pages, so you could look at a particular gene of interest. So you're doing a, a study on CML, and you're interested in the BRCA um, uh, mutation, what, what, whatever you might be interested in. Um, it has a pathway entity page. So similar to what uh, uh, Trevor was showing, if you have a mute, you can see in a particular pathway where all of your somatic mutations might fall. Uh, it has mutation entity page. So if you want to look at one particular variant, uh, you can do that. Uh, and of course, as I was saying, it also has the genomic viewing page. So you can see uh, right down to a sequence level, um, gene mutation level, you can see what, what your data, um, how it renders from a, a visual perspective. Lots of, inf lots of other ways to explore data within the DCC. Um, as I was saying before, the entity pages, so you can have donors, genes, mutations, uh, but there's also uh, here, uh, an advanced search option. So this is the icon for advanced search. And you can drill down to a particular donor and find all of the information on a particular donor. Um, it's, it's just it's, uh, really interesting uh, to also see uh, the statistics and, and um, other information from your donor. I mean, you can select. In the faucets over here on the left, you can select all males between the ages of 35 and 50, non-smoker, who have lung cancer from China. 
you could you could drill down in that way to to ask very interesting questions. I think it's quite quite useful. The other icon uh, is data analysis, so you can do uh, deeper analyses such as enrichment analysis um, and looking at um, phenotypes. Uh, this is the enrichment analysis is done, but some of the other deeper analyses are just coming on board. Uh, it is a data repository, so that means that if you have done the search that you are interested in and you've come up with all of the, the donors associated with a particular search, you can output your data. So you can output uh, all of the data that you would be interested in. Um, so this is, this is his schematic of output. Uh, you select what searches you, were you had done. You uh, can download and output the uh, file right to your desktop. And then, of course, you can um, view it. You can command line, evaluate it, etc. So uh, we'll leave this for um, another moment in time. Uh, later in the week. You're going to come to all that. Okay, so ICGC versus TCGA. Uh, they're the same, but they're different. Um, so ICGC houses the TCGA open data, uh, but then beyond the open data part, then it, it actually splits. Um, so uh, the TCGA BAM FASTQ files will be stored in TCGA and all the rest of the, the international uh, participants will have their BAM FASTQ files in ICGC uh, and in within EGA. Uh, and the reason, so, so uh, from a Venn diagram, this is what it, it looks like. Uh, we do, ICGC does contain the TCGA open data. Uh, but beyond the open data, then there, there are differences. And the differences come because of the, uh, I think it's in a couple of slides, but there's, um, because of the definition of what is open. So the U.S. has a different definition of what is considered open versus uh, what the, the rest of the international community has agreed upon would be open data within cancer space. Um, so... Um, uh, yeah, you just want to you just want to pay attention to to those differences and 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 understand it. And if you need the data within TCGA, then you have to go to TCGA to, to drill down to get that data. Okay. Uh, so open access data sets within ICGC and closed access data sets within ICGC. So the DCC portal that I just demonstrated contains open data. So this is free to use to anybody. What you don't get is you don't get the controlled data, and you need privileged access to that. You can get privileged access, and we'll just talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, there are things that are not available in the open uh, in the open portal. So these are these. This is what is uh, on the on the right side here. This is what is. Uh, uh, under controlled access, and this is obviously un it's under controlled access because it's I it identify it, it's identifiable data. Um, but so the ICGC uh, open data contains somatic variants from exome or whole genome sequence. In comparison, the TCGA uh, and the US, which defines um, uh, open data differently. Only somatic variants from scrubbed exome sequencing are contained in the, in the portal. And most of the somatic variants from whole genome sequencing, they consider to be identifiable data, and this is under controlled access. So you have to be, be aware that, that uh, in the DCC portal, you're not going to be seeing uh, the control the, the somatic variants from TCGA data if it's from whole genome. Uh, okay, so so as I was saying, the biggest difference is how they how they define open access. Uh, and at the NIH, uh, some simple somatic mutations from exome sequencing experiments are open access, but from whole genome sequencing, these are controlled access. 
uh, and you won't find them in the ICGC data portal. Um, so, so if you want that, you have to go to the TCGA portal. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Um, there is, though, an agreement on who is a controlled access person. Uh, so, so the ICGC and the TCGA have agreed that um, you have to keep all of your computer systems where the controlled access data resides. It must be um, up to date with security protocols uh, and software patches, etc., so that it cannot be hacked. Um, that you must protect that controlled access data and only give access to people who have been authorized to gain access to that data, uh, and that this authorization and this access is monitored. Uh, the groups also agree that when your access is up, that all of the data is destroyed, uh, that you're using secure transfer protocols when you're downloading or sharing that data, uh, as well as encrypting um, that data. Uh, any of the variants that are discovered within the ICGC TCGA project are still put into COSMIC without all the identifying uh, information, so you can still find uh, those novel variants within, within COSMIC. Cosmic being, of course, everybody's heard of Cosmic, right? The catalog of somatic mutations in cancer. Uh, if not, we're going to be using this quite a lot uh, in, in the workshop. And you can download uh, all of the, the Cosmic data from uh, the, the Cosmic website if you needed to. So underlying ICGC, uh, and how do you get controlled access to the, all of this data and there's a whole bunch of different groups uh, uh, within ICGC um, uh, doing various things so uh, there's project groups there's working groups uh, for example a working group might might develop the protocol for sequencing on an Illumina machine how do you make your library how, how do you do DNA extraction how do you make your library uh, what fragment size do you use? How do you sequence? So everybody's following the same protocols. Um, but the, the gr uh, group that we're going to talk about is the, uh, the DACO group. So the Data Access Compliance Office. So if you would like access to the controlled access data, this, you, this is what you need to do. You need to identify yourself, fill out the form. It's a whole bunch of paperwork um, that contains... Uh, the information that you want access to, the IT that you have uh, for keeping the data secure, uh, etc., and you must agree to the the um, the rules of accessing controlled data, and you you sign it, your institution signs it, and you send it back. The person who signs it, though, uh, from your institution, is the person that can fire you should you break any of those rules. So, so it's it's you know, um, under that person's authority that if they if it's reported that you um, did something unapproved with that information, like share it with a colleague who didn't have DACO access, then uh, your the, the the DACO office can notify your uh, institution and you, you're, you, you know, it's the, the regulations are there for a reason. Uh, that being said, it's not. Um, there's a, a huge number of people who have access to the data because it's really useful to be able to compute on this this data. Uh, so this is the login page if you uh, have access. So uh, this is Francis uh, logging in. And he's filling out his information uh, as if he was applying for DACO controlled access. And currently, if you did not have controlled access and you logged in, this is what you would, you would have nothing. Everything is red. If you have DACO approval, uh, then everything turns green. And this is it's a sort of an indication of, of the kinds of things that you can gain access to. The application, it's really, it's not very long. Uh, it's, it's available online. Uh, 
Uh, and once you have approval, you can log in with OpenID, Google ID, etc. So it's, it's linked in with other ID systems. Uh, and login is at the top of the portal, and you'll see a different uh, version of the portal then. Uh, all of the data within the portal um, undergoes a publication moratorium, and it differs depending on when the data was submitted and how much of that data has been submitted. But you should be aware of the, of the moratorium on publication. The reason that there is a moratorium is that the group who computed, like let's say Canada, let's say, uh, is doing pancreatic data and they are submitting their pancreatic data to the ICGC. Well, they have first rights to publish on the pancreatic data before a group in, let's say, Italy wanted to publish on pancreatic data. I mean, it's it seems scientifically fair that that, that kind of moratorium exists. Uh, it, it, it differs uh, depending on on the data submitted. So the yellow bars are the submission time point. You have two years uh, before the moratorium is removed if you have a small amount of data that you're submitting. If you're submitting large amounts of data, like 100 submissions, your time point is actually shorter. Um, if you do one submission and then you do a big bulk submission, then you get one year after that. So it's sort of falls back to this model here. Uh, if you do uh, more than one and then you do 100, well, it starts to say, well, you know, you're, you've already reached, um, you have 100, but you, at two years, this is the two-year point, from this submission, your, your time is up. The moratorium is, is released. So that's sort of, there is a moratorium, and sort of depends on, on the data, uh, but the, all of that is clearly marked within the, the controlled data. Uh, and if you want more information on publication guidelines, there of course are available. So ICGC puts its raw data within EBI's uh, EGA. Uh, so if you're looking for, for the, raw, the raw data, uh, the, raw, the raw controlled data is within EGA. Uh, TCGA is storing it in the uh, cancer genome hub. CG Hub, I believe, um, and that's that's where you would gain access to uh, the data. So, so from the IC again to reiterate, from the ICGC website, you can get open data. If you're looking for controlled access data, uh, that data is um, behind uh, a login uh, and also stored within EGA. Lots and lots of documentation. Um, within ICGC on all of these bits and the URLs for all the things that I have talked about. Things that we have not talked about which are just as important um, is, is a study that is just wrapping up right now. Um, actually, I, I suspect that the it will conclude while you are in this workshop and it'll be uh, uh, announced while you're in this workshop. It's really, really critical evaluation. Um, some earlier publications have already come out from, from TCGA on a, on a pan-cancer analysis, but this is a pan-cancer analysis now using all of the ICGC data. I, th I believe they did 2,000 uh, tumors. Have anybody out where? Anyways, so what they've done is the, they selected tumor normal pairs from across a whole bunch of different tumors within the ICGC and they are computing it in the same way. So they're doing the same alignment, the same variant calling tools, the same um, quality control filters, etc. So all of the data has been analyzed in similar pipelines. In fact, there were three pipelines uh, the pipelines were merged, so the, the overlap with those pipelines, all of the data was validated. So, so it's a, a huge amount of effort. I think it's a couple of years that they've been working on this, but that should be finishing this week, and that is coming available. As well, there is the Can International Cancer Genome Consortium Collaboratory in the Cloud. So it's one thing to have all of this ICGC data available. If you can't compute on it, 
all in one space. You don't want to download all of that to your laptop. Uh, what do you do? You don't have all the research. So the collaboratory is a place to go where you can compute and all of the data from ICGC is sitting there. So that's, that's what ICGC is about. That is the end of my part. Uh, and we're going to switch to uh, IGV at this point in time. But before we switch, are there any questions on the information that I presented on behalf of Francis? You're all familiar. You, all, you, you knew that all anyways, right? Yes, no. It's, I think it's really interesting stuff. There's two lab exercises that we will um, endeavor to do this after the lunch break. One is on IGV. Uh, this one is the one that we're going to start with because you're going to spend the rest of your week doing IGV. Uh, but there is also an exercise on ICGC and learning to do some analyses with it. It's a really, really, really cool portal. Um, especially if you're like myself, I have a biological background and the command line doesn't come as naturally, but being able to drill down using faucets is really, really, really helpful. Any questions? So this pan cancer project that you mentioned, you mentioned the data are coming from ICGC. I see, yeah. Yes, that's correct. And it, also on the um, slide, it said 2,800 whole genomic mutations yes. were yes, thank you. Is yes. this like an addition to ICGC? No. So, so 2,800 tumor normal pairs from the submitted data within ICGC were selected to participate in this pan-cancer whole genome analysis. Uh, so it, it, a whole bunch of tumor normal whole genome sequences from various projects within ICGC were selected. Basically a subset of ICGC. Yes. Uh, very good question. I, I believe the whole data, the pan cancer analysis is going to be unrestricted. Uh, I think it's going to be open. Um, I'm going to double check because I'm going to go right upstairs and I'm going to ask the girl who's in charge of the project um, and ask her. I think it's I think it's going to be open data. And what I'm going to ask her actually is whether whether any TCGA whole genomes were in that 2800 because I suspect that they weren't in order to allow the somatic calls to be open, right? But I, I'm going to double check that uh, and I'll come back. Good question. Anything else? Okay, let's move on to, we'll do the lecture for IGV, then we'll break for lunch, uh, and then we'll come back after lunch and we'll do the lab exercises, okay? Okay. Um, so, hi everyone. So, I'm Florence. I'm covering as well for Francis, so this is not my slide, but uh, for freezes will go smoothly. And I actually know that most of... Most of the examples on those slides are borrowed from the ICGC tutorial, uh, IC, IGV tutorial from the Broad Institute. So um, um, IGV actually have a very good uh, tutorial if you want to refer to. So I will go through um, a few basic of IGV to give you an idea of what we can do with it. And the tutorial will be this afternoon so you can practice it. Um, so first IGV, it's a general browser. There are actually quite a few different ones you can use. This one has been is highly used by the community and the uh, research cancer community. Um, you can upload different type of data. As you can see, there are several screenshots. You can, as uh, actually Trevor showed this morning, it's lecture. He had already several screenshots of IGV. Um, it can be epigenomic data, microarray, and uh, high throughput sequencing data, some analytic data, some expression data, some copy number data. Um, that's all different formats that will be accepted and you can be able to visualize, visualize it. Um, what can we do with IGV? 
We can explore large genomic data sets with intuitive and easy to use and surface. Basically, um, you can integrate as, as well some different data, some clinical data and some genomic data, for example. You can use data from your own data, so have it on your computer, on your server, and load it. You can use it some data that are remotely accessed or even on the cloud. And this is a good feature because <coughs> you would might want to see some TCGA data, but you don't want to download everything on locally and then look at it. So you would be able to have access remotely. Um, and you can as, as well um, have some uh, implement some automatic tasks. If you want to take some screenshot of a particular all your variant you've been called, you can actually automate, uh, write a script to make this automatic. So it will go to the right location and take a screenshot and save it for you. This is quite an event uh, usage, but that's possible. Um, so yes, uh, this, uh, data source you can use, um, as I just said, a local file. You can use data from an HTTP server, FTP server from the, the cloud and um, from other data repositories, so it's local or remote. remote. Um, the basic of IGV, first you would load it, uh, you would select a reference genome, you would load the data you want to look at, and then you would navigate through it. Uh, for whole genome sequencing data, we can look at SNVs, or we can look at structural variants as an example. So that's the standard thing you would do with IGV. Um, so if you go on the IGV web page, uh, on the here, where am I? Yeah. here you can see it's a way you would um, go through to be able to access it. Either you can load it directly from the website, or you can register and download the IGV application to be able to run it locally on your laptop. And this is a type of <coughs> screen you're gonna get when you. Um, you're on IGV. First, you're gonna select the genome you wanna work with, um, AG18, AG19. Now it's only AG19, um, but you still have the option. Sorry. Um, and then you will load it. So you will load your data um, by file loading, um, either from a server, either from sorry. Um, is a, a file you have on your laptop from your URL. And you can as well load some public data. Um, and here that was an example of a tutorial. You can use a public uh, data example. So the screen layout, uh, this is the basic default one. Um, so you have different uh, parts in this, uh, on this page. At the top, you have the menu as a standard application. You have the toolbar. Um, which you can play with, uh, like to go back to the initial setting, or uh, to turn off and on and on a, a pop-up information that can become quite annoying once it's all went on. So it's something that's probably something you're gonna turn off by default. We're gonna see that in the tutorial. You do have the the genome ruler track. So here you can see we actually look at the whole human chromosome, chromosome one to twenty-two and X and Y. Um, and then we're going to be able to zoom in. Every single row below it's a track, so every sample has a uh, correspond to a track. Um, and then we, so since we zoom completely out, you don't see much, you just see coverage. Um, you have the track name on the left, um, and you have actually here the attributes column information. So you can load some clinical data, for example, you can specify um, if you have the sex of the patient, if you have if it's metastasis or not, if you have a classification uh, of the type of tumor you're looking at. So this can be color coded here. And uh, you can sort uh, with those as well. So that helps you to sort the track in a particular manner. And at the bottom, the genome feature. Uh, this is, so that would be where the, where the gene um, description are, so you can See that uh, if you zoom in, you will see the name of the gene and then the the, <coughs> the location of the exon and the intron and things like this. So, what file format can you use? Um, basically, the file format you input gonna define how your track is gonna look like. Um, so, it's you don't have to to um, to give the setting because he would recognize that it's a band file, so it's gonna show 
what you want to show for by themselves, the reads that are aligned, and then you can sort them in different methods. These are an example of uh, the file format you be able that IGV can handle, and actually there are uh, more than that, so there is a list uh, under the link that is at the bottom. Um, the classic one for us for isopro sequencing now it's BAM, bed file as well. Um, that's the one um, we use it most of the time, but they all, um, they all, yeah, you can all use all of them. Um, so we want to view some alignment. Uh, so that's the uh, world genome view and what you start with and then you don't see much and they actually have an indication that you, ne you need to zoom in to see the alignment. So you would do that by using either putting a, press, a, more pre a particular position here or just zooming it with this bar. Yep. And when you zoom in, how far do you need to go to actually see the element? Uh, well, it depends on the BAM file you've been uploading. Um, usually it's 30K. Um, it depends on what is your uh, coverage. So uh, how much read you have at a particular rotation location. So if your coverage is very high, you will need a lot of memory, so you don't, you're don't. going to have to zoom more to be able to, um, to see it. Uh, if you have low coverage, um, that's easier, but we always prefer higher coverage. So it's just a trade-off. It's not a, I cannot give you a number, it's just in function of the data you're going to load. But you're going to experience it, and it's not very hard to just look at it. Um, so when we zoom in, we can actually go deeper and deeper, and that's the same kind of uh, view you, you saw on Trevor Lecture. So what is all the gray are the reads that are mapped, and they are mapped properly, so they are gray. If you actually go, so if the color goes more transparent even to the white, that means, I don't think there is, no, I, I don't see an example of a bad read here, but that means the quality of the read mapping is, is pro when it's going to white. So you wouldn't trust it. So if you have a kind of background gray, it's good. And then all this color uh, bar, like you can see as a blue, um, is that all the mismatches compared to the reference. So if you have a, a colon of <coughs> mismatch like um, here, that's pretty consistent at the same position. You, it's likely to be a SNPs or an SNB in function of your data. Um, um, so you can visually kind of spot it, what what's might be more interesting in your data, and then you can zoom in and zoom in and, and see more things. We're going to do it uh, this afternoon in the tutorial. So the SNV and structural variation, so that's what we can uh, mainly look at when you have whole genome sequencing. So what are the important metrics we want to look at to evaluate if it's an SNV? Um, first, the coverage. Then how often this alternate base is actually present, the amount of support. Is there any piece of artifact? Are all the reads that have this uh, different uh, this mutation, are they all on the same strand or are they equally distributed on both strands? Uh, if they are all on the same strand, that's not a good indication. That means something is that is probably an artifact. The mapping quality of the base as well. Um, the stronger the color, the better is the quality. So if it's a, you will see in the next slide, if it's a dark red, that means the quality was very good on this base. If it's a lighter gray, uh, red for the T, that means it was not a good quality. Um, so that's what you're going to look at for particular SNV to be able to <coughs> judge by yourself after you've been calling it with some, uh, some tool to see if you trust it or not. Um, in terms of structural variant, we're going to look at the coverage, the inversion insert size. Um, I will give an example after. So if you have a non-expected insert size, you would you, that's a good indication that the structural variant happened. And some read pair orientation. I will, um, we have some slide about showing uh, how this happened. So that's an example of a SNP and a, or an SNV. So basically, you can see um, that there is an alternative to the to the LL as being a T. Um, and on the top, you have the 
coverage uh, track. I just want to show my mouse. I'm here. Yes. Here. So that gives you the percentage of T to, um, to C. Here. So you can see it's basically uh, 60 to 40 percent. So that would be a, a pterozygous SNP as an example. And you, uh, you can sort. <coughs> You can sort the, the, all the read by base, and you would have all the T at the top. Um, this is an example of another one. And here we color the read by um, strand. So um, the red one is the reverse, it's a forward strand, and the blue one is the reverse strand. So you can see that all the alternated bases that um, are here, the, the Cs, are on a particular strand. So, and none of them are on the red reads. So it's not a, a good indication of a trustable uh, SNB, for example. Okay. <coughs> uh, we can look at some uh, view some structural events. Um, so the pair read can give you a good indication of um, if a structural event happened, like a duplication, a deletion, translocation, or innovation, for example. Um, we can we can uh, check the <coughs> the infer and uh, insert size and the pair orientation. That's the other two things you you can use to detect a structural event visually. So when you do pair and sequencing, you have your DNA, uh, your cDNA, uh, you convert it, and then you do you fragment your DNA, and then you will um, select a particular size. Um, usually, it's just 300, 350 base pairs. Um, so, of course, there is a distribution of how uh, of the site, so it's an average 350, but then there is some tails. And then you will um, add some adapters, and then you will start sequencing, like following the two arrow, like going inside. So that's the pair reads, that's the standard uh, sequencing uh, pair reads you would have. Um, so you're expecting a particular insert side as a, when the <coughs> experiment goes well, and when you don't have any structural variant. Um, quite often, it's 350 base pair. Well, it depends on your experiment. You won't know when you have the data, but that's a standard um, insert base size. So when you align it, when you align your pair read, you can actually infer the insertion size to check how this read, how far apart they are. So if they are a lot further or a lot closer, something happened to your genome as compared to the reference one. So the infection scan can be used to detect deletion, insertion, and interchromosomal rearrangement. It happens that sometimes you pair read one of the pair would map on one chromosome and the other one on the other chromosome. So probably a translocation happened if both map uh, well. So that's an indication. And you can see it and actually have a color of the suite on IGB to help you to detect those. So if we, go, if we take the example of a deletion, what is the effect of a deletion on the infer insert side? So let's say we have the reference genomes, <coughs> um, and in your subject, you lose the part in the middle, which is in red. So your, your two extreme ones are going to come together, as you would see in the animation. And then you would have your normal um, fragmentation of the demon and sequencing with the adapter, and you would have the the normal uh, insert sand on, on your sample, which would be that. But then when you map your reads, these two reads to the reference genome, they're going to be a lot further apart. So the inferred in, uh, insert side is um, larger than the expected value, as you can see. Um, <clears throat> and on your IGV, you can actually color your read by um, uh, insert size. And it will happen like this. So you have the, the red one is a pair um, with larger expect, uh, expected insert side are coloring in red. And you can see that in this region uh, for this particular example, you have less read covering <coughs> the region in the middle. This less than than on the right and on the left. And you have this red uh, pair that are at the extremity, which are the, the, the limit. Uh, of the deletion. 
but you still have red in the middle, so it's not a homozygous deletion, it's probably an heterozygous deletion. Make sense? Um, another explanation would be that um, it's a tumor sample, and not all the cell in your particular sample has a deletion, if it's an homogeneous one. So you would still have some read from the cell that don't have it, and, some, and you would miss the red the, so for the ones that have the deletion. So that's another way of interpreting the data. It's in function of what 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 is your actually sample your, your sample. Um, so the color code, um, the smaller than expected cell side are blue, the larger one are red, and when the <coughs> the pair map on different chromosome, you would you can, you will have the pair colored in function of the chromosome number. Um, yeah, you don't have to remember that of course, but um, you if you have a multicolor um, screen, you will know that it's because it's it's mapping on different chromosomes. And IGV allow you to um, actually split your screen into two. So if you have some reads that are here, for example, on chromosome one, and the pair match to chromosome six, you can actually um, um, use a setting on IGV to have half of your screen looking at the pair, uh, part of the pair on chromosome one and the other part on chromosome six. That's a useful um, um, setup uh, to, to explore those events, those structural events. Um, yeah, the, uh, here's the color of the MET on chromosome 6. It's brown. Well, it's, it's uh, brown in 1 and uh, blue in 6. So <clears throat> the other thing we can look at is the read pair orientation. Um, orientation of the pair can reveal Inversion, uh, duplication, translocation, and complex rearrangement. So the orientation is defined in terms of uh, read strands, so less vessels right, and read order, the first vessel, the second. Uh, we're going to go through an example. So if we want to look at an inversion, you have the basic reference genome um, and the section we're looking at. And in your sample, you have an invasion with the segment A to B, which become BA. Okay, so what's happen when you sequence it? Um, you will have a fragment um, around B with your pair oriented like this, as a normal pair would look like. <coughs> but when you when you map it to the reference genome, the so first the the left part of the pair would map normally before A, but the right part of the, of the pair would map towards B on the actually other orientation that you are not what you were expecting. All right? And if we look at a read pair that would be close to A on your sample, the sequence uh, <coughs> the sequences would happen like this. The right part of the pair would map normally to your reference genome close to B. Or the, uh, sorry, the, the right part of your genome. And the left part of the read pair going to map in the orientation close to Y. Okay, so basically you end up with read in the same orientation, like this or like this, um, and uh, further apart that you were expected. So that's a typical type of read pair we would look for in emission. Um, so you expect, um, so you were expecting inward facing, and they are actually in the same orientation. So the the ones that are both in the same direction, uh, starting from left, are the left side pair, are called the left side pair, and the other one are the right side pair. And they have a particular color code. The so left side pair are turquoise, I believe, um, and the right side pair are um, darker blue. Now that's a color that IGV is going to use. So when you're on IGV, you can color by pair orientation. That's uh, on the menu. And you will, <coughs> uh, you might have some uh, screen that looks like this when you have your left side pair and right side pair on both uh, sides of the boundary of your inversion. And you can uh, notice as well the drop in the coverage at the breakpoint of your inversion um, as you on the coverage track here. Here. 
So that would be an invasion. Um, and that's a convention um, for the different color and the different type of uh, read orientations that are other than what you would have on a standard uh, regular genome. Um, you have the left-right, which is the standard one. Then you have the left-left going um, to the same orientation or to the right-right. Or uh, right-left, which is that uh, the last one, the green one that we looked at last translocation or actually duplication. So that's a standard read pair. Um, and that's... Uh, That's going to be the lab. And that's the acknowledgement time for conferences. <laughs> Do you have any question? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, can you want to go back to the slide of the deletions? Yeah. Before, uh, after? I think the next one, the one that has the reads. This one. Yeah. So the reads, the reads are the small blobs, right? Yeah. So we, yeah. So can you explain exactly where you see the deletion that there are less blobs in the middle? So you have these red ones and those red ones. Yeah. And they should be closer together than what they are. Yeah. So what the red tell you that the insertion. So the space between your reads are actually closer than expected. Okay, and where do all the reads in the middle come from? They are, they are fine. But where do they come from if it's a... It's, uh, so it's a, it's a heterogeneous uh, deletion, so it's from the normal copy. Oh, okay. It's a, what I was uh, saying, that it could be a tumor sample that has some heterogeneity. So you would have some cells that have the deletion and some cells that don't. So you have read from both, from the good, the normal cell, of the. If you would lose it in both chromosomes, or would this? That would be empty. If it's really empty. Yes, okay. we don't. We wouldn't have any any read mapping to this region. If it's really homogeneous and really thin sample. If you do a single sense that you have an homogeneous deletion, then right. it would be empty. And if you go, to, can you go to the rearrangement, which is two or more? Right. So here you have, you have a piece of, so the, the, in the first line, the red read and the blue read should both be on the same chromosome. Yeah. So, so everything it, you have in the middle is the... So you, you cut your, so basically here you have two patterns. So you look at the chromosome, it's part of the chromosome 1 and part of the chromosome 6. Um, you have it because you have pairs that are linked, that link these two regions. So you can actually um, turn another one to look at new pair and you would, you would see how they are linked. So, uh, so where, where do you see the link between the... You would actually, you can click and you would know where is the pair. And there is a, a menu, uh, we would do that this afternoon. You can click on a particular view, uh, and they will tell you his pair map at this particular position on this chromosome. So it's too far. Yeah, but here you, so that uh, here I give you allow you to actually open this position and you can see that you have several reads supporting the same as you have several reads pair that are both on chromosome one and that pair are on chromosome six. If you only had the one, you wouldn't trust it, it's just a misalignment. But you have a um, um, higher than expected number of pairs that have this mate on two chromosomes. And the, the lack of reads in the middle is that you have rearrangement and deletions in the rearrangement. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If a pair reads the, well within the boundary of a big chunk of inversion, would that two read be colored? So, um, if you know which are your pair, because um, when you do the sequencing, you 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 know that this read is um, oh. there is a tag from your read. So you and your band, you know that this is a read one and this is a read two of your pair. So you expect them to be close, and then if they are not, that's why they are colored together. They are going to be colored. Still be colored. Okay. It's what I mean. From 
from your from your your BAM file, you know that this sequence and this sequence are the, the pair you're expecting. Yeah. The pairs they will show up in the same line rows. What do you mean? read pairs? Yes. Do so you to show in the same line. Um, yeah. Well, here we collapse it, so you have several. Um, that would be with your coverage being very high. If you only have one pair per line, it would be just way way too strong. So we collapse it, so you have several uh, read pairs on the same line. But yes. There. But as you will see this afternoon, you can click on a particular read, like on a particular gray box, and they will tell you exactly where his pair map to. And you actually can, yeah, you can try, you can find where is the pair exactly. You can color it as well. All right. Thank you. Okay. I have feedback on the pan cancer whole genome analysis. It's not the answer I expected. Um, so the data is going to be both open and controlled. The data set is because the data set does include TCGA data, which is masked. So the TCGA data, somatic mutations, will be masked. And only in the controlled access could you gain that information. Yeah, so it's, it actually follows the same split model. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, so the the germline depend. Yes, of course. The germline is actually the identifiable data. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're concluded for the lecture.